welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Hello, my name is James Curran and welcome to the third episode of the Graduate Job Podcast. This week, I speak with author and careers expert Richard Morn as we explore Richard's three job hunting secrets. Implement these and you'll be well on the way to bagging that amazing job. A full transcript to the episode and links to everything we discuss can be found in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash jobhuntingsecrets. I won't leave you in suspense any longer. Let's go straight to episode three. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Graduate Job Podcast. I'd like to extend a very warm welcome today to Richard Morn, business coach, author of the excellent Job Hunting 3.0 and visiting lecturer on career matters and communication skills. Richard, welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast. James, thank you very much indeed. Nice to be here. So I've given the listeners a very quick introduction to to what you do. Mm-hmm. Uh, would you like to tell us about yourself and uh, you know your business and, and what you do? Yeah, that's, that's very easy. I work as a business coach and I work generally with executives and middle managers to improve their personal performance because I'm conscious that by working with the people you'll improve the business. Um, and my two modalities, if you like, are uh, lean process improvement skills because I have a manufacturing operations background, and also transactional analysis, which is a branch of psychotherapy. And although I'm not a psychotherapist myself, um, I do work at a slightly deeper level with clients because often there are things that get in the way of their own progress. And if you like, my job is to work with them to unpick that. So that's, mm. that's the kind of thing I do, and, and I work across all industries, and I do lots of work in the NHS, and I'm also a visiting lecturer at um, both um, the UEA and at Cranfield, um, and my uh, original um, work at Cranfield was very much to do with career development, which is what's taken me to write the books and things, because it became obvious that teaching people leadership skills was one thing, however, helping them to get jobs to use those leadership skills was something else entirely, so... I was a module leader and ran a series of programs called Self-Management for Success. And the books have sprung out of that because they've been based on real life activity. And today we're going to um, talk with about extracts from primarily the book Job Hunting 3.0, right. Secrets and Skills to Sell Yourself Effectively in the Modern Age. So in this book, Richard, you talk about three job hunting secrets, as, as you term them, term them and I found the each of the secrets was very powerful, and I know that our listeners are going to find it extremely useful. So maybe if we start with the first secret, do you want to uh, have a big reveal and tell us what the first secret is? Yes. Um, the reason behind the three secrets, I should say, is that I think the national sport is trusting to luck. And if you unpick these secrets and make good use of them, then you will be head and shoulders above the crowd. Um, so the first secret I have is um, P for passion. Secret number one is passion. And um, the reason for picking on this is that if you have lots of people who are going for a job, they may have very similar backgrounds, they may have very similar CVs, and yet it's how you present yourself to a potential employer is what will clinch it for, to clinch the job for you. Mm. And of course, when we talk about passion, it's very easy to say, oh, I'm passionate about a football club or I'm passionate about uh, the latest pop group or something. And, the, and lots of people, unfortunately, fall over if they're asked the question at an interview, you know, tell me what you're passionate about. And they say, oh, I'm, I'm so passionate about working in office supplies. You know, I, I can't, can't believe that I'm having this interview. And it's just fake, quite frankly. And um, so we are talking about genuine passion here, genuine deep-seated enthusiasm. That's what we mean by passion. How can you put that across in an interview situation without it sounding, as you said, um, like a reality TV show going, oh, wow, that's so amazing? (laughs) Well, that's a good point you make, and I'm sure we've all seen various reality TV shows where people are so passionate you want to weep, really. And um, I I suppose the way of getting it across is to be genuine. Um, Lots of people seem to manufacture passion in the moment, and it's not founded on anything. So if I really was passionate about working in office supplies... I might well have been to an office supplies conference. I might well have uh, read, you know, read several books about how wonderful they were and how they were invented. I will have spent a lot of time researching the company. I might have done voluntary work, working in the office supply sector on a voluntary basis. 
because I'm so keen to break into that market. I want to know about the market. I want to have, have known who the movers and shakers are. And that level of enthusiasm starts to show through because if you say to somebody, I'm very passionate, their next question is going to be, prove it. Mm-hmm. So if you've got stories you can you can call on and say, well, I was at the conference last week and I was speaking to so and so about it. You know, I, I used to work in a corner shop and I've got a huge collection of staples and things. The fact that you've got the I know I'm making it fanciful, but the point is the process is the same for anything. If you've got the detail and you've got a bit of experience, then that convinces people. So the, yep. so so you need to have that background to it because you all know if someone's passionate about the local football club they will have programs they will have been to matches they know who the captain of the team is and therefore if you have that level of backup you can convince somebody yeah uh, that's definitely true and thinking back to um interviews that I've had which have gone well have been for as you mentioned jobs that I'm interested in and and passionate about um and then ones where I can remember it was a um, a graduate scheme for a, a credit card, a well-known credit card, and I got put forward for it by a, a graduate recruiter, and I wasn't particularly interested in it. And you know, the feedback naturally came back that well, you did really well on the competencies, but we didn't really get the why you wanted to work here, which was entirely true because I, you know. I wasn't passionate about the company. No, and you see, that's a good point you make. Um, You weren't passionate about it, and the point of passion is that it's a risk-reducing factor. People seem to forget that hiring someone is incredibly risky, it's fraught with danger, it's going to cost them tens of thousands of pounds, so what they absolutely don't want to do is make a mistake. Therefore, if you've got someone who maybe hasn't got the best grades, hasn't necessarily got the best um, degree qualification, but is but just comes across as being someone they can do business with, a likable, energetic, enthusiastic person, then they're much more likely to take a risk on you. An American friend of mine is married to an English guy, and she says, uh, generalising, that all English men are emotionally suppressed. Um, <laughs> how would you recommend for those emotionally suppressed men to demonstrate that that passion because you know it tends to be bred out of us at, um, at quite a young age it, it does indeed actually it's a, it's a good point you make um i think you've got to have um if i say your heart in the right place what i mean by that is you have to value yourself and you have to say to yourself i'm okay i have a right to be here i do enjoy this subject and in fact i am going to share that subject um with the other person so if you're going into a job interview with your head down saying i'm never going to get this it's i can't sell it's all rubbish then you might as well turn around and go home so i don't mean to oversell but by certain, by all means you must look at yourself and think do you know what i i do like this i want to share it The other thing that that does make a difference is if you hold eye contact and smile. It's very easy when you're going for a job interview to answer the question and have your eye bouncing all over the room, and that doesn't help you at all. I mean, go to a nightclub and try and chat someone up and don't make eye contact with them, and you'll just come across as being a bit creepy. So the same, I mean, it's true, people forget that what they do in life they can take into um, into an interview environment. So you make eye contact, and you take a breath and say... I love writing books. It gives me enormous satisfaction to see the end products. Um, I research them. I spend hundreds of hours honing the text. And, and you know, it's something I really enjoy doing. And now you can hear the smile in my voice as I'm saying those words. I'm speaking the truth. I'm holding that space. I'm smiling as I speak. And the whole package adds up to I'm talking the truth and I'm passionate. Mm. Conversely then, would... Would you recommend that people don't apply for jobs where they don't have that passion or should they try and generate that passion or become passionate about it or to fake it? Well, um, I've never say fake it because you're going to get found out. The trick, though, the trick is to find something to be passionate about. Now, I've coached people in a whole number of different organizations, factories, hospitals, some are clean, some are dirty. And it'd be very easy for me, if you like, to wrinkle my nose a bit and think, oh gosh, this is a, a, an unclean engineering business, for example's sake. However, if you're passionate about manufacturing, if you're passionate about working with people, if you're passionate about working in the insurance industry, or if you particularly like maths and you think, I'm really passionate about the numerical side of this job, then it's finding that thing to be passionate about. So, 
you, if we take insurance as an example, you could say to yourself, on one hand, it's quite a quiet office environment. It, you know, people don't do cartwheels around the office. That, what's, what is there to be passionate about? However, you could say, actually, you're enabling people to, to drive and to insure their houses. You're providing um, emotional sort of support to them because having insurance provides that. It involves uh, numbers and statistics. So you might find you enjoy those things. And once you start to hone in on the detail, you can be passionate about the detail and focus on that. And then people will extrapolate from that and say, gosh, that Richard Morn, he loved talking about numbers and things. I've you know, never met someone so animated. That's true. I'd, um, I'd not thought about it like that. <laughs> and and but so it's, it's, it's that sense of you can find the passion in anything. If you think of it at a basic human level, everyone's got skill and talent. Everyone's got goodness. And it's about finding that. And you can do that in any job you walk into. So the, the trick is to know the things that you personally are engaged by that gets you, that, you know, that really makes you smile and think, oh, I really enjoyed that. And when the interviewer asks you a question and says, so Richard, um, you did a geography degree, how does that relate to working as a coach, for example's sake? Which sounds like a bit of an oddball question, but I believe you, either. I have been asked it. And I, and I say, well, actually, geography is about spatial awareness. It's about having um, a multidisciplinary approach. And being a coach requires me to understand what's going on in my environment and be able to think about both the numerical side of things, the strategic side of things, and so on and so forth. Now, you can hear in my answer there that I genuinely believe all that stuff. I love geography, I love working as a coach, and I'm just, I'm just talking about something that I feel strongly about. Excellent. So, listeners, secret number one is passion. And moving on to secret number two, I know this is something which strikes fear into many people's hearts, including my own. Um, Richard, would you like to enlighten us on number two? Uh, yeah, I, I would do. It's very simple. Again, this one begins with an N. And it's networking, so it's enough for networking. And um, the reason for going for this for number two is there's a massive secret job market out there. You know, 95% of jobs are not advertised. They go to people who know people who know people. So if you're looking at a newspaper and there are 100 jobs in there, there'll be another two or 3,000 that you won't get to hear about. And networking is the, the skill that enables you to find the opportunity. The other thing about networking that people overlook completely is if, for example, I'm talking to you, James, and then you meet someone tomorrow who says, oh, I'm looking for a business coach, and you say, oh, I know this guy called Richard Morn, he's really nice, he's really, really passionate about it, then you're already selling me in, and that client will overlook that I may not have a particular qualification or particular experience. So networking allows you to be sold at a human level, you see. So it's, it, it, that's the double hit with it. You find the job and you get sold into it. So from a graduate point of view, if you're recently graduated from university, yeah. you might not have a particularly large network outside of your peers at university yeah. and, your, and your friends. Mm -hmm. How can you go about starting to network so it's effective in your job hunt? That's a great question there, James. Effective networking starts off by making a list of people you know. So if you know your family, they will know people. It's very tempting to think of mum and dad as being sort of grey-haired old fogies. It could be, though, that your, your, your mum knows the chairman of a local organisation. Um, so I always say start with people at home. Then think about your relatives. Who, do, who, who are they? Where do they work? Who do they know? Then think about your, your immediate peer group. Who are they? Who do they know? That immediately gives you about 15 to 20 people you can go and talk to. So networking is about talking to people and it starts with talking to your, your immediate family, your uncles and your aunts for example sake and saying I'm looking for a job, who do you know who? That's the most valuable question. Who do you know who who might be able to help me? Not can I have a job, it's who do you know? So that's the first thing is, is really to be methodical about it. It's amazing that you always know more people than you, than you think you do. And I always say to people, you can always email me and say, Richard, who do you know? And you'd be amazed how many people don't ask. So by asking, gets you ahead of the game. The other thing you can do is be very practically minded. Look at your local community and think to yourself, where's a good place to go and, and um, talk to people? So there are local business clubs that meet. Um, you can go along to those as a guest, often for free. And even if it costs you 20, sort of 10 or 12 pounds a month to go along, you can, you can join them. And rather than turn up and say, I'm a graduate, I'm looking for work, you can say to yourself, yeah, I've done a marketing degree. I'm thinking of setting myself up in, up in business as a, a marketing um, consultant. 
and I'm just sort of feeling my way in the world and, and gathering information. People will be very happy to help you, and you've just met another 50 people that way. It's a um, famous saying, uh, your network is your net worth. <laughs> so the number of people you know. Well, it's absolutely right, and you always know more people than you, than you realise, and people will, are always going to be more helpful. So the, so the first thing is, look to your, I'm, I'm not joking, look to your family and start to tell people that you're looking for work. The second thing is, look to your community and, and from a business perspective and go business networking. And the third thing is, volunteer. I have a radio show on a Thursday and we have a number of graduates coming into the radio show to act as producers and, and supporters and things. And um, I always say to them, you now know me and ask me what do you want how can I help you and in fact I've just got our producer a job because she had that conversation and said okay Rich put your money where your mouth is then you're this careers guy what do I do and I said you know go and start talking to people and of course she's talked to people at the radio station and lo and behold she's been sat in the studio for the last 12 weeks with her future employer brilliant you, you talk in the book about uh, developing a, a seven second cell can you expand on what this is and how to create one yeah a seven second cell it might be also called an elevator pitch and basically it's describe yourself in ten words and the reason is um, when someone says tell me about yourself you want to be relatively succinct as we were at the head of the conversation so if someone says to me tell me about yourself Richard and I will say I'm a business coach I have a radio show and I've written six books now within that um, people want to know more. What's the radio show, Richard? Gosh, what books have you have you written? And it means that I've differentiated myself from other coaches. I've established a little bit of my personality and I've given the other person something interesting to chew on. They may not want to talk to me, um, you know, after that. They might say, thanks, Rich, I'm going to go and get a cup of tea now. But they won't meet another me. Very true. And you talk in the book as well about having aiming for a network of 2,000 people, uh, which I thought was quite an impressively large number. Um, I think I've got 400 on LinkedIn. That's good. Um, so how can how can you go about getting you know up to up to 2,000? Thinking specifically about online tools. Well, I think the obvious thing is LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, uh, I set myself targets for social media about um, 10 years ago, and said I wanted to have so many in each group and um, I've now got two and a half thousand Twitter followers for, an exa for example and I think I've got about 800 LinkedIn um, contacts and by setting targets meant that I went and pushed the buttons and I sat at my desk uh, when times were quiet and I followed relevant people so I made sure I followed some local business people and then followed their followers and I did the same with LinkedIn and you suddenly find that whilst 2,000 may seem quite a large number, with a bit of diligence and some application, you can get to that number relatively quickly. Twitter will take you a, a longer time because you can't use automatic robots and things and it takes people a bit of time to follow you back. But LinkedIn, I don't know, you could have 500 people after a month maybe and then for 2,000 after three months. Well, um, I'll set myself that target now. So, uh... <laughs> and the point of the target though, James, is to give people a focus on whether they uh, uh, focus on how successful they need to be because as soon as you set yourself a target you can monitor it and you can manage your performance if you want to get there you need to measure it and put targets in place mm. absolutely right so so moving on to the third secret mm. <laughs> the third one well we've done passion that was number one we've just done networking that was number two and the third one, I think, is probably the biggest bugbear I come up against when I coach people to get jobs and to, and to pass interviews, and it's P4 practice. Um, the reason for practice is it never ceases to amaze me how um, anybody, a graduate, a middle manager, a senior manager, can go for a job and expect people to pay them maybe £30,000 they're going to be with the company a couple of years, so you're looking at £60,000 plus a laptop plus costs. So basically, you're asking your employer, I'd like you to give me £100,000, please, over the next two or three years, and I've done no practice for this interview or whatsoever. And when you put the numbers to it, it brings it home to people that you are asking for money. So practice is really what makes perfect. And as you, you mentioned in the book, um, it's not a question of you know, knowing what to do. It's actually doing what you know and... You know, it's no good reading the book. It's about then, okay, I'm going to do the exercises. I'm going to go out and network. I'm going to speak to people. It's then, you know, putting the 
putting it into practice, as you say. Uh, very much. I mean, the book, the book Job Hunting 3.0 has, has been written from practical, real-life teaching and coaching. It's based on, on working with um, graduate-type people and middle-manager-type people. And I've seen time and again, the bit that makes a difference at the end of the day is that the successful people practice and they can be scared, they can be nervous, they can be frightened, but they still practice. Because you can say to your mate, I'm a bit nervous about networking, but I'm going to do it. Can you come and hold my hand sort of thing? And if you're going to go for a job interview and ask someone to basically, you're selling yourself in return for tens of thousands of pounds, you need to know your stories. You need to have your stories in the muscle. So that, mean, that, that means that you need to know them spontaneously. Um, and for example, I've had people who've not known their CV. And you say, so uh, James, um, you you went to uh, you know X or Y University, and James at interview says, uh, oh yeah, did I? Oh yeah, can I just have a look at my CV? I haven't, I haven't read it recently, <laughs> and I'm, I I promise you that I promise that's happened. And I and I flipped it around and said, shall I go out and come back again and give you ten minutes to practice? And I've been, and you, and the candidate of course knows the interview is slipping away from them at that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and yet they'll have polished their shoes, maybe they'll have they'll have bought a new shirt, they'll have had their hair styled, and they don't they they don't know what they did in life. So practice really is about sitting down, making your mistakes at home, getting a friend to bounce questions off you, and to work at it until you can pull the answers out of your head. Because when you're under stress, it's very easy to forget stuff, and practice is what carries you over the line. From a practical point of view, then, what exercises would you recommend for you know job seekers who are going through the graduate application process for companies? Um, I think the, the first thing is actually to do stuff. Um, it's very tempting for people to wait until they see their dream job and then apply for it. The trouble is you need to cut your teeth on all the other jobs that you weren't so fussed about. So the first thing I would say is always have a target of maybe five good applications every week. Of those, four can be things you're perhaps not so fussed about, but that will give you a chance to practice writing answers and thinking about yourself. The other thing is you need a great CV, and you need to be able to talk about that CV. So you can print off a CV, give it to your, your housemate or your parent or your girlfriend or whomever, and say, can you ask me questions about that? So I get confident talking about myself and knowing my stories. And then the third thing is actually to practice the interview. Practice shaking hands, practice making eye contact with people. And whilst that might sound um, a bit of a, an easy tip, it's amazing how many chaps shake like they're shaking a wet lettuce. It's amazing how many times they don't make eye contact. Or if I say something like, James, tell me about the time when you've handled a really difficult customer. Um, you, you know, you're coming for a job in the service industry and you say, oh gosh, let, let me think for a minute. Uh, um, uh, um. Whereas the answer is, Thank you for the question. And interestingly, I had a difficult customer three weeks ago when, dot, 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 you've got the answer already in your head, you see. You, you mentioned there having, um, having supporters, and that's one of the um, things mentioned in the book that mm. is a, I wish I'd had when I was going through the process, was having people who are you know, mentors yep. or a group of specific supporters who are there to help you through the, through the journey. What type of people is it good to to rope into this role? The, the, um, the, the, the prime requirement for your supporters is that they actually want you to get a job. I coached a group of people who were self-sustaining in terms of support, but they were all, they all said to each other, I'm okay, Jack, as long as you haven't got a job. Oh, the Bob and Brian haven't got a job. That's okay. <clears throat> Whilst it sounds obvious, if your best mate always says to you, don't worry, I don't practice and I got a job, ignore them you do not want them in your team because what you want is someone who says great let's practice let me have a look at your cv how are you doing have you met your targets yet and whether that's a friend a partner a parent an uncle an old tutor they need to have your best interests at heart and really be supporting you and gently nudging you forwards all the time rather than simply buying you a beer and saying oh well mate better luck next month again you mentioned in the beginning of the book the the job hunting road is a difficult one. You're going to hit setbacks. You're going to, um, you know, there's going to be times when you're, when you're feeling down, mm. you're feeling depressed. Absolutely. You need somebody who can, people around you, a network who can, who can lift you up and get you back on the road. I think so. So you do want people to be nice to you. And clearly, if you have had an awful day, it's nice to have a hug or to go for a beer or just to sit and talk about it. But that's a sort of value adding support. Um, and I think what you find is you quite quickly can sort your friends into two groups. 
those who actually will be constructive and those who simply will just um, you know want to chat about nothing and not really add value to you and I would always say find the constructive people they're, they're not always the people who you think you are and I know for myself that when I set up in business um, I phoned an old lecturer and I and I went out and bought him a beer and basically asked him for all of his tips and I phoned a managing director friend and then I said to both of those people who do you know who could help me and both of them gave me a couple of names I ended up with a group of five supporters who all did something different one did sales one did marketing and so on and yet they all wanted me to be successful and were sort of would email me and say hey getting on rich and you know did, did that work and and it was very nice to have that environment and they were saying they do say you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with so you need to make sure those five people are positive and they're going to keep you going and not going to be bringing you down i agree i agree and and if you're with people who aren't getting a job perhaps themselves and are saying oh this is all a bit too much like hard work and i can't be bothered then you might need to think to yourself you know perhaps i'll put those into as into my weekend friend group but during the week when i'm job hunting i'll have a different support group because it will make a difference it will power you forwards and energize you excellent so listeners there are the the three secrets from richard you need to make sure that as we said you actually then put these into practice and start to fulfill them yourself so richard before we finish let's go to the the lightning round where i ask you three questions uh, in quick succession okay so the first off um do you have a book that you'd recommend to graduate job seekers do I have a book I'd recommend? Um, obviously, I'm going to say Job Hunting 3.0. Um, if, if only because it's a practical book that has been written based on sort of more graduate experiences. Um, and what I would say to people is any book is better than no book. However, you have to take it off the shelf and read it. And not just read it, but actually do the exercises. Um, I was going to say lots of people have got books on their shelf, so um, ah. I would say do that and read it. Excellent. Do you have an internet resource that you'd point people to? Do I have an internet resource that I would point people to? I would say go to Hootsuite and use that to help manage your Twitter accounts um, because um, it's a great way of um, stratifying your followers and making sure you've got lists set up so you can capture particular job opportunities or maybe enter into particular discussions. I've not used that one myself. Uh, listeners, that will be linked to in the show notes. So yeah. go to the show notes and you'll be able to uh, be able to find out more about Hootsuite. Yeah. Hoot, and Hootsuite is free. And because it's an internet-based app, you don't have to download anything to your, your device. You can access it from anywhere. But it's a great way of managing your tweets. Uh, we do like ones that are free. <laughs> and finally, uh, do you have a tip that you can give people that they can implement straight away to help them with their job hunt? Um, a tip to help them, I would say, is to construct um, a spreadsheet that has targets on it so that you give yourself some numbers to shoot for. For example, um, I always say to people, go networking twice a week. And by that, I mean meet two people um, twice, one person twice a week, if that makes sense. Go meet two people twice a week and then have a target that flows from that. So you might say um, two t people to meet five good job applications and I'm going to build to say 500 LinkedIn supporters over the course of the month. If you get the targets on your paper and you meet them, you'll be a lot more successful than someone who's just simply putting letters in a post box. Richard, excellent. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, before we close, how can people get in touch with you and uh, your work? Um, very easy. All the W's, richardmorn.com. And Morn is M-A-U-N. That's richardmorn.com. Or you can find me via Amazon. Um, but I would just say go to richardmorn.com. I'm very contactable. Find me from there. And, and I may add, if people say, oh, he's plugging his own book, I'm bound to. However... Any book about job hunting that scores highly on Amazon is better than not having a book. And that's what I always say to people. You know, do something. It's always better than doing nothing. Richard, thank you again for appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast. Thank you very much, James. Thanks again to Richard Morn for sharing his job hunting secrets. Hope you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. And if you implement these tips, and I mean implement them properly, get out there, network, proactively practice, you can't help but improve. In terms of my personal three top takeaways from the episode, firstly, passion. Don't underestimate the importance of passion. Have it for the job you're applying to and you'll stand out a mile. Conversely, if you're applying for a job and you don't have the passion, 
stop and think why. Are you applying for the right job? Is this something you really want to spend your time doing? Maybe you're just applying for the experience of going through the application process, but don't fool yourself. You spend a lot of your life working and you don't want to waste it doing something you don't care about. Secondly, networking. The key point which really struck home for me was to ask, who do you know who? I'd not thought about networking in this way before and rather naively I'd always thought that networking meant just actually asking people for a job. It's now a question that I utilise on the podcast. At the end of the show I asked all the guests, who do you know who I should speak to? And it's been extremely helpful. One of Auntie Robin's quotes is that successful people ask better questions and as a result they get better answers. This is definitely a better question to ask. Finally, practice. It's in your hands. All it takes is effort. Utilise your friends. Practice together. Listen to episode one of the graduatejobpodcast.com slash interviews and check out John Gregory's Spotlight Technique, a great tool for practising and then internalising answers. And finally, don't forget to set yourself targets. It's been three weeks since the interview and in that time I've gone up from 400 to 475 LinkedIn contacts, although a long way to go to get as many as Richard. The full transcript of today's episode can be found on the website at graduatejobpodcast.com slash jobhuntingsecrets. Please do get in touch via Twitter as well at gradjobpodcast. And finally, do leave a review on iTunes. I read everyone and it's great to hear your feedback. Do join us next week when we have best-selling author Steve Rook sharing his tips for how to find a job you'll love. Hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, hope you use it and apply it. See you next week.